you, Apostle, a couple weeks ago asked me when I was preaching, when I'm going to be preaching this week, to preach on bitterness. Bitterness. Bitterness is something that we think we don't have. It comes up and sneaks up on you. In fact, out of the root of bitterness comes unforgiveness. We deal with unforgiveness so much, and we think bitterness is a byproduct of unforgiveness, but unforgiveness is a product of bitterness. Bitterness is a root. If you look here in Hebrews chapter 12, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Look at this. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest let the root of bitterness springing up trouble in you, thereby, thereby many are defiled. Keep the root of bitterness from springing up and troubling you, because that's how many are defiled. The root of what? What did the word say there? Root of, root of, we deal so much with unforgiveness, and we leave bitterness there. And when we leave bitterness in its place, then unforgiveness is not truly gone from our life. We harbor it, because we have not dealt with the root that produced the fruit of unforgiveness. And we wonder, why are we like that? Bitterness stems from a couple of things. Bitterness in this word here, me, the Greek word that bitterness is derived from right here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. The Greek word there means poison. Poison. You ever felt your body when you're holding something against somebody just kind of feel like a, a coldness come over it? I don't know. I passed out in my truck. One, I, I, I played video games all night. It must have been... When I was 19 or 20 years old, I was a youth pastor. I had the youth praying on Saturday morning at 7 o'clock. So on Friday evening, I decided to get with my best friend and play video games all night long. We played video games all night. I mean, we played Need for Speed. Anybody remember that? Anybody remember my We played Need for Speed. You know, you just get in the Gran Turismo. We played all, we played all night. That's when it first came out. I'm dating myself. And we were played all night long. I must have left there 6 o'clock in the morning, got to my bed, said I'm going to get a half hour of sleep, and then I'm going to go to the church, and I'm going to pray with the teenagers. Well, I got out, and I was driving, and I passed out in my truck. I had a big Chevy pickup truck with a 350 engine in it that when you hit the gas, it was going to move things. They said I passed out. My foot went down on the gas. We were at a stoplight. When we were at the stoplight, the van in front of me, my truck bumped him and started to move him into the intersection. Truck was powerful. Somebody that was behind me realized that I had passed out of my truck, came in. I had my window down. I never have my window down. He came in through the truck in neutral and turned the keys off. Right there. Turned it off. Got me out of the truck. Ambulance came, took me up. So they're running all these tests on me. They put me in something called a, a tilt table. I don't know if anybody here is medical, but they put me on the tilt table. They started to inject Isopro into my body. They couldn't figure out why I passed out. I'm thinking I played these video games all night long, try to get up and go and pray with these. I'm not as a young puppy anymore. I can't do, I've been doing lock-ins almost every other weekend all night long. You got to stay up, keep your eye on them. Drive vans to places all over the place. Got to keep shouting hand check because you don't know what's going on in the back of the van. You shout it every five minutes. I still say it now. They're 40 years old. They still put their hands up in the air when I'm around them. It's entrenched in them. And they put me on this tilt table, started to inject Isopro. And when they put me on the tilt table and started to inject this thing, boom, I was out. God, I remember a coldness coming into my veins. I remember that coldness hit my heart, and I remember going, I said, I even told the nurses, here it comes. And within seconds, out. I think of bitterness in that way that when we harbor, bitterness is just harboring, holding on to something that somebody did to you or wronged you by. It is a byproduct of offense. They kind of go hand in hand. Offense is what somebody does to you. Bitterness is the result of it when we hold on to it. Are you there? Offense, the Greek word means scandal, scandal on, which we get the word scandal, which we could derive. The Bible clearly states is the bait of of Satan. If you guys want to get a book, there's a book called Bait of Satan. And it, um, oh, Revere is his name. Uh-huh. John Revere. 
John Brevere used to be here with Benny Hinn in Orlando. Powerful book. It's the bait of Satan. It, the, just Satan will use offenses to get bitterness in our life so they get in unforgiveness. Bitterness turns into resentment. Resentment turns into unforgiveness. It all moves and it all flows together. Eventually, it brings spiritual death and can bring physical death. It brings ailment. It gives the devil a legal right into our life. Bitterness is a problem that it affects each and every one of us if we will hold on to it. It is a poison that helps us to filter and shape our life through it. If we overcome it, we could be filtered by the Holy Spirit. But if we let bitterness in our life, it filters it through our relationships. We start to treat people out of that experience. It filters into how God is supposed to react to us. Because sometimes we may fall and we may think, oh my gosh, God's not going to pick me up. Because that bitterness is in our heart. And there's somebody else that we may have been harboring bitterness towards. And we start to personify our feelings and our experiences upon God when God is loving and God is kind and God is true. He is slow to anger but quick to respond to us. He responds with love first. That if we say, Father, come and rescue me. The Bible says no matter where we are, no matter what we've done, no matter where we're at, He rescues us time after time after time after time. That's why the Word says God is not a man that He should lie. Thank God. God, because if I was God, there'd be a whole lot of people zapped out the world already. I got an amen because somebody agrees with me. They think the same thing. But God is God. He is loving. He is kind. He is just. And it starts to, bitterness starts to put a filter on our spiritual lenses that we think God will react adverse to how the Word says He would react. We start to live a life that is an offended life. Everything offends us because we think everybody is looking at us. That's not true. Hello? That's where rejection is born. Everybody's looking at me. Everybody, they're whispering over there. They're talking about, they're not talking about you. Chances are they're not. And if they are, thank God. God, because the Bible says, Jesus says, woe unto the man where everybody speaks well of you. Ouch. Hello. Jesus said it's going to happen. They talked about him all the time. Yet he kept walking. He kept loving. He kept healing. He kept delivering. He kept moving. Bitterness. It's a poison. It gets in there. I believe it's plagued the body of Christ, and we're going to deal with it this morning. Amen. You guys like the carpet? Hallelujah. Nice. I have the privilege of preaching on this thing this morning. Hallelujah. I'm going to take my shoes and socks off and run on this one. If I could figure out if my toenails were cut or not, I'd take my socks off. <laughs> Hallelujah. Bitterness. We're talking about bitterness this morning. Bitterness starts with an offense. Bitterness starts with an offense. Turn to Luke chapter 17, verse 1. Bitterness starts with an offense. Luke 17, verse 1. <laughs> then as he said to the disciples, it is impossible. It is what? Let me hear everybody. One, two, three. It is what? Impossible. Say it again. It is impossible. Can't happen. If Jesus said it can't happen, it can't happen. Hello? That no offenses should come. A mature Christian knows how to deal with offense. A mature Christian doesn't get offended all the time. Jesus said it is impossible for offenses to come. Impossible. You are going to get offended. And offense, if offense is going to drag you down and drag you into bitterness, I guarantee you the devil will offend you every hour. 
He will bring somebody to offend you. He'll bring a situation to offend you. You'll be watching a TV show and it'll offend you. One time I was watching The Bachelorette. I never watched The Bachelorette after this. Sarah loved The Bachelorette. I mean, she was I were putting on The Bachelorette, watching The Bachelorette, and this girl got up to the altar, and this guy, this guy comes up. He chooses her, and she chooses him, and she, well, he chose her. Let me get it. It was The Bachelor. He chose her, fairy tale. Next thing you know, they get on the show. It was the first one. They get on the show, and he says, I'm not in love with you. You know the after show? How they're doing? Show's over. Months have gone by, but it looks like a week has gone by because it's the next ep episode after the last episode. And he says, I'm not in love with you. And I got up off of that couch. I took the pillow that she had on that couch. I threw it right at the TV set. What do you mean you're not in love with her? You told her, will you marry me? She said, why are you getting so upset? He just got on TV and told millions of Americans he's not in love with her. The girl is embarrassed. Look at her. Could he not have done this in private? Could they not have brought her on? It? I got so upset. I never watched Bachelor or Bachelorette again. That was it. It was done. That was about 2007 or 2000. It was done. I said, oh, you turn this thing on to this TV, you better warn me. I'm going to my room. If you don't warn me, we're going to have a broken TV set, and I'm going to have to go buy a new one. You go. Will you watch anything you want? Just give me a warning. I got so mad. I was offended. I didn't get bitter over it, but I was offended. Offense will come. It will happen in anything. I get offended when FSU loses to the Gators. I am not offended when the Gators lose to FSU. I will drive to Gainesville, and I will be right there in the middle of, of that campus with a big sign. I'm going to rip me one of those LED card things. FSU beats the Gators this year. I'm going to put it on there. I'm going to let them, you, you guys lost. I'm going to make them drive. All, I'll pay for it to drive all over that campus. Or the Hurricanes, both of them. <laughs> Dade County. Offense comes all the time. Somebody could cut you off in traffic. Guess what? Hello. It's impossible for offense not to come. That's what the word says. It's what? Impossible. Let me talk about offense before I move on in the scripture. There are two types of offense. There's good offense, good offense. What's good offense, Pastor? Good offense is when somebody comes to your life and you are going in the wrong direction and they tell you to your face, this is wrong. What you are doing is wrong. you got to turn around. At that moment, what you think you are doing is right. And in that moment in your head, you are saying, who do they think they are to tell me that? And you're offended. It happens in the church all the time. My mentor offended me and they go to apostle. I'm offended. And they may have been telling you the right thing. But because you felt offended and you thought it was bad offense because in our perspective, we are right. That's why God has got to send somebody to tell you something so that you could move in the other direction. It's not to hurt your feelings. It's to get your life on the right track so that you don't mess up. Glad I got some amens on that. There's good offense. Good offense. Jonah. Jonah was offended. You guys know the story of Jonah? Get to Nineveh. You know why he didn't want to go to Nineveh? He was bitter. They had killed his people, his brothers, his sisters, his cousins. His family was wiped out, his friends. And God said, I want you to go preach at Nineveh. It wasn't that Jonah didn't believe. Jonah believed. Jonah believed that if he went to Nineveh and preached the word, that they were going to fall and repent and turn to God. Jonah didn't want him saved. Jonah didn't want him delivered. Jonah wanted to wrath the God on him. He had bitterness inside. And he had every right to be bitter because his family was gone. They killed. They maimed. They embarrassed. So Jonah gets on a boat and says, I won't go there. I'd rather die. And if I get on this boat... And he got on a boat that was going in the opposite direction. Get me as far away from Nineveh as possible. Bitterness. He's offended. Was God wrong or was Jonah wrong? He was offended because sometimes we think our offense is right and we get hurt. And somebody's got to deal with this. And because I'm offended, somebody's got to go correct the other person. Instead of looking at the perspective of God, is it good offense? God came and said, go preach. Then it, 
to add insult to injury, there's ways that they can't navigate. These are, these are skilled ship guys. Skilled. They know how to weather storms. They could see it coming. They didn't have GPS, but they could see it. They could feel it. They could know it. They could navigate through it. And the storm was so great that they're like, oh, my gosh, start throwing things overboard. And Jonah gets to the front of the boat. He said, you know what? I'm still not going to Nineveh. Throw me overboard. Couldn't even throw himself overboard. He's so offended he wants to bring everybody into his offense. We get so offended, we want to bring everybody into our offense. We want somebody to support us, to tell us what we are doing is right, to tell us our perspective is okay. It's going to be okay. Uh, Elder Andre, he's a nut. I never liked him anyway. He has no good words for you. It's okay, Pastor Dave. We'll, we stand with you. Elder Andre is wrong. And nobody knew if Elder Andre said the right thing. Hello? Hello? Bring people into our offense. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but you know what he did? He went and said this, and he went and said that. And bring everybody into the offense. He couldn't even throw himself overboard. Couldn't even take responsibility for himself. He's bitter. They throw him overboard. He's ready. I'm going to die. This is over. He didn't even think if I die, I got to see God and answer to him. He's so bitter, he's blinded. Throws him overboard. God said, we ain't done with you yet. My call was for you to go to Nineveh. That's why if you got a calling on your life, there ain't nothing that the devil could do that could keep you from it. God's going to get you to it one way or another. You could throw yourself over. You could have somebody throw you overboard. You could think you're going to die, but in that moment, God will be there. He will be a beacon of light. He will shine light on your light. He will pull you back and get your feet back on the path that he created you to be on. You could take that to the bank. And he sits and he goes, and he, he's in the water. Can you imagine? I'm going to die. Blah, 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 blah. I'm going to die. Blah, blah, blah. He's going under. Maybe this time I go under it. That's it. But I'm not going to Nineveh. He's like a little baby kicking and screaming in the middle of the ocean. He's not going anywhere. Doesn't even say God saved me, the God that he served, the God that he was a prophet for, the God that he loved, the God that showed him things that no one else could see. He wanted to die. Bitterness. So God says, well, I want you to go to Nineveh. I got this whale, this big fish. I'm going to command the big fish to go and swallow him up. He swallows him up. Can you imagine Jonah? Jonah is in the stomach of this whale. Can you imagine what a stomach of a whale is like? Anybody? Slimy, nasty, dead fish, smelly. You know what God was doing? I'm trying to get you to see your heart, Jonah. Bitterness brings a stench. You may be able to hide it, but you know some old folks that are bitter. You know what I'm saying? And they just complain about everything. They're not a joy to be around. I don't like your car. I don't like the pain. I don't like the house. I don't like the room. I don't like the bed sheet. I don't like anything. I don't like that food. I don't want you to take care of me. I don't want this. I don't want bitter. Poison. Poison that spreads through your body. God says, Jonah, I need you to smell yourself right in the middle of the stomach. I need you to open your eyes and see. The Bible says after three days, boy, three days. God's got a thing with three days. God has got a thing with, I'm gonna, Jonah, I'm going to put you through the process of death to your flesh and put you back on my spirit. And in three days, Jonah spit up on dry land. Guess where he spit up on? It was like a submarine before there was a submarine. He takes him out there, and he goes, whale comes up on dry land, spits him out on dry land. That's it. Special delivery. God dealt with him for three days, three nights, and took him. But he was dealing with bitterness. There are two types of bitterness. There's good bitterness, or two types of offense. There's good offense, and then there is bad offense. Someone has intentionally offended you. Someone has intentionally offended you. You are going to have this all the time. 
You're going to have it on your job. You're going to have it in your family. And heaven forbid, but it is true. I'm just stating a matter of fact. You're going to have it in the church. We are filled with imperfect people. There's plenty of people here, and not one of us are perfect. And the devil's going to say, leave that church because this person offended you. At that moment, who's going to win, your flesh or God? Because you go to the next church, guess what? It's just a matter of time. You're going to be offended again. I don't like the way that Pastor Dave worships. He's got his hands behind his back, and he's got his head down. Yeah, I can worship any way I want. Sometimes I got my hands up. Sometimes I got my hands on my back. Sometimes God is dealing with my heart. It doesn't matter. You can't be offended by that, but that's what a spirit of offense will do. In all things, I am worshiping. In all things, you are worshiping. I can't get on you. Some lay prostrate on the floor. Some dance around. Some jump. Hey, whatever God leads you to do. But we can't get offended by that. One guy came into a church one time. He goes, your music is too loud. I can't come back there. It's just too loud. I'm like, okay, they got a Catholic church or a Presbyterian church down the road. You go there and keep it nice and really quiet. One time I had a pastor who was renting a unit next to our church, and he said, he called me in for a meeting on a Monday. He asked me, could you come meet with me, pastor? Yeah, I'll come meet with you. So after work, I went and we met with him, and he said, y'all are too loud. I said, you all are Seventh-day Adventist. We're not even, you're not even here when we worship. Never forget the guy. He looked like Kobe Bryant. I was like, are you Kobe's brother? I was like, man. Because if I pick a fight with you, I want to make sure he's not coming from L.A. over here. You know what I'm saying? Offense. Offense. You start to filter that way. There's bad offense. People intentionally harm you. That's going to happen. Jesus said it's going to happen. Say offense will come to yourself. Come on, say it louder. Some of y'all are trying to live like offense will never come in your life. But it's not that offense won't come. It's how you deal with it. That's why we're here. If offense turns into bitterness, that's a problem. Watch what Jesus says. It is impossible for, that no offenses should come, but woe to him through which they come. God is saying when he says woe to him, I'll deal with that. If it's a bad offense... Some of us, somebody comes to offend us in a good way to try to get us to change, and God sent them, and then we say things like, oh, God's going to get them. No, God's not going to get them. God sent them. Hello, somebody. And then when somebody bad comes and intentionally harms us, we say, God's going to get them. But a mature Christian doesn't say God's going to get them. A mature Christian says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I know you all glow in the dark, but I ain't there yet. Hallelujah. Am I better? Yes. Are there moments? Yes. But I immediately have to give it to God. And God will tell me immediately, you need to go apologize to that person. And I hate apologizing to somebody that intentionally tried to harm me. So if I, God said, well, if you don't want to apologize to them, don't offend them. Don't go after them when they offend you. Or I'm going to take you to apologize to them time after time after time. But if you don't go apologize, it's going to sit in your heart and it's going to turn into bitterness. And bitterness is going to leave an open door for the enemy to come in and do what he wants to do in your life. We have to learn to deal with this. We have to learn to deal with the bad offenses. Offenses are a weapon for Satan's destruction. Offenses are a weapon for Satan's destruction. Remember, offense, scandal on, scandal, bait of Satan. It includes it, uh, bitterness. It comes, bitterness comes out of it, which is poison, comes into our life and contaminates. One of the things that offense brings it, and bitterness brings is division division. It brings first and foremost a division to our heart. We start to be blinded and not see who we are in Christ. And if we are not settled who we are in our heart, 
The enemy could blow us in the wind like a, we are dandelions. We would go to and from. We're like a dandelion in a hurricane. You ever saw that? Oh, my gosh. Everywhere, all the time, being blown around. Every emotional thing, every offense, every argument, every quarrel, every situation, everything blown around, blown around, blown around. And we're moving in circles. It brings division to the heart. Some people, most people, I think, get offended because it's a matter of security. You know, we grew up with, the, with the, what we used to say, <laughs> sticks and stones may break our bones, but names will never hurt me. We used to grow up saying that, you know. It was a declaration. We didn't know it at the time. Now it's a different day and age because we have the phones. We have whenever somebody does something wrong, it's 200 people within 30 seconds that knows there's wrong. It's an embarrassment. Before, we could keep it among friends. We could be like five people would know, you know, and maybe 40, 50, 60 days out, 100 people may know, but by then, it's blown over and everybody forgot about it. Now, 200 people in 30 seconds. And the pressure that is on a younger generation, even adult suicide rates up for the first time since the 1970s among teenagers. Why? The image, the pressure. And the devil has made it to where they could get so easily offended and most of the teenagers are looking within themselves and saying, what did I do wrong? And they blame themselves. And it's nothing that they did wrong. It is the devil trying to attack them and take them out before their time that if they had some security in their heart with broken families the way they are now and the, 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 the home not having everybody in it, not the majority of homes not having everybody in it, there's no security. They're starting out on a bad leg and they have this thing when, when kids got, have their parents divorce the most common thing that they say is it's my fault they think they could have did something better to keep mom and dad together they think they could have did something that kept push mom and dad apart and they say it's my fault and it's not their fault but it opens the door for offenses to come into their life and put pressure on their heart to where they start doing things and they become bitter before they even get started in life We got to watch bad offenses and the division of the heart. We got to make sure that God is in there. And I've seen it among Christians. Oh my gosh, when we get in fights and arguments and things, whenever we can I air this out in the church? I'm not saying King Jesus ministry, we glow in the dark, but I'm saying the church in general. When there are arguments and fights, man, we get it because there's issues of the heart. Jealous of anointing and mantles and titles and this and that. And I should be doing that. They shouldn't be doing this. Man, I love wrestling. I watched an interview with Charlotte Flair the other night. Stone Cold Steve Austin was interviewing her. For those of you that don't rule wrestling, Charlotte Flair is the daughter of Ric Flair, one of the greatest wrestlers of all time. And I like watching these interviews because on the TV set, they're playing a part. But I want to see the real person. And Charlotte Flair talks about her brother Reed committing suicide when she was getting in the business. This. And she said, Reed could never get over that stuff came so easily for her in the wrestling business and was not happening for him. And that there was a little bit of bitterness in him. She, and she's crying because she said, if maybe I would have communicated with him more, maybe if I would have loved him more, maybe if I would have talked to him about this more, he wouldn't be dead now. And she's blaming herself for, for it. And I'm watching the interview, and I'm watching her pull herself together. And she's saying things like, you know, I was lost, and I didn't have no purpose, and I didn't know where I was going. And she's making it seem like she still has it together. And I'm saying she's still going through trouble. And then she says the words, I'm still dealing with his death. Some 15 years later. You don't know what offense and bitterness could do to somebody's life. The poison that comes in and takes the heart. There needs to be a security. You are not a pastor. You are not an elder. You are not a deacon. You are not a house of peace leader. You are a child of God. You have a relationship with the Most High God. That is the basis of our foundation. Pastoring is what I do. Son of God is who I am. And I have to have a security that if somebody is bringing an offense against me, the Lord has got to be able to tell me, don't respond to it. And every fiber of my being is telling me, go attack them. But God is staying, stand still. I am God. I will deal with it. 
And I will deal with it in a way that you won't deal with it. Because I love you and I love the person that is offending you. And I want to bring you all to a reconciliation in me together. So if you get involved, Dave, you're going to screw this up. Let me do it. But it has to be a security of the heart. The Bible says the issues of life flow from the heart. The heart. Everything that everybody deals with is the heart. That's why Jesus came and died and rose again for the We think about everything we deliver people from. Unforgiveness. The heart. Right? Lust. Everything physical. Doesn't just happen because it's physical. Heart. Rejection. Hello? Am I talking to somebody? We try to change the external dynamics. But Jesus didn't come to change the external. He came to change the internal. Because he knew the seeds had to come here. And the fruit is the external. So he said, I'm not dealing with the fruit. I need to deal with the seed that grows the tree. Depression. Heart. I feel abandoned. Heart. Those people don't know who I am. Heart, because you don't know who you are. If you knew who you were, you would not even be complaining that they didn't know who they were. Jesus went and preached in his hometown. He sat down right there. The Bible says when he was in the synagogue, he read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He healed the brokenhearted, set the captive free, give liberty to oppress. He didn't say that, recovery of sight to the blind. He said that, sat down, and they're like offended because he sat down in the seat of the Messiah. And they said, is this not the carpenter's son? And they couldn't see him for who he was. And the Bible says he could not do many miracles. But what you didn't see is that Jesus never rebuked them. He was secure with himself. You could try, you could preach, you could teach, you could lay hands, but if people don't see what God has in you, it ain't going to happen. And it's not your fault. They didn't believe God. It's not about your identity. It's about the kingdom. Right? So we don't, if we know it's about the kingdom and that's in our heart and I'm a child of God, then whenever somebody doesn't respond a certain way or somebody doesn't say a certain thing or somebody doesn't respect me a certain way, that's okay because that's about the kingdom. I'm secure that I'm a child of God. He knows my name. He talks with me. He walks with me every day of my life. He whispers the things in my ear that I need to hear when nobody else is saying it. He gives me the security I need. Sarah, Sarah when is Sarah getting an argument with me? And she'd sit there and, whatever. I hated that. Oh, my gosh. Whatever. Whatever. Do what you want, and I'll bail you out again. Her nice little quiet voice. Doesn't even raise her voice. Nice. Whatever. Whatever. What do you mean, whatever? I'm done with this. What do you mean you're done with this? I'm not done. Well, you could go and scream at the wall because I'm done. Whatever. Do what you want. I'll bail you out. And I said, you don't know what you got. And you know you say some things sometimes when you're in an argument. And then she would turn around. She'd go, listen, when are you going to realize that I'm your wife? And that I am a child of the Most High God. And the reason I could love you is because he loves me. I can't give you what I don't have. She was telling me this. So I know, Mr. David Young, that even in a moment, I know you love me, but you're not showing it. 
So I can't rest upon you not showing me love in this moment. I rest on I've been with my father at 6 a.m. this morning, and he poured his love into me that I'm not going to respond to your lack of love right now because I got the love of the father flowing through my veins. So what I'm telling you is I don't need your love right now. I'm secure. So when you get over your pity party, then come back, apologize to me, and we can continue walking together and then say whatever and walk right out the door. And that's how you handle a male that is all, ah! because that ah turns into, did she just preach to me? <laughs> and you realize yourself. You got to learn to deal with the heart. Let God deal with this. Bitterness brings division. It brings offense, brings bitterness, brings division, division of the heart, division with God. Division with God. Not that God pulls himself from us, but that we pull ourselves from God. See what I'm saying? God will chase us down, but we're too busy running too fast from him. That's why the word says, be still and know that I'm God. So he, right back to me. The devil's whole scheme is to get us separated from God. Because he knows if he could separate us from God, us in our flesh cannot defend ourselves. We cannot withstand his power. The flesh cannot withstand his power. It can't. What did he tempt Eve with? Flesh. Eve was made with flesh. Hello. Adam was made from the dirt of the ground. God breathed life into him. But Eve, a rib was taken from Adam. She was made with flesh. Why did the enemy go after her and not? Well, first of all, Adam should have been there to cover her. Why did the enemy not go after Adam and went after Eve? Flesh. He only could attack flesh. That's why Jesus said, be crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, my flesh, but it is Christ that lives through me, spirit. The enemy cannot attack spirit. He knows he's lost. But enemy's goal is he's got to bring us into the flesh for him to have a legal right. Offenses are a way, bait of Satan, to trap us, ensnare us into the flesh. So that he could work his thing. Are you here with me today? I'm not here to condemn everybody. I'm here to bring everybody up. But we got to deal with, we got to have surgery so you can bring it up, right? Bitterness. Bitterness. Brings a division to the heart, brings a division with God, and it brings a division with others. We start to filter through this thing. And we start to look at relationships, and that person ain't going to like me. Oh, they're not going to like You spoke it before you even met them. They're not going to like me. Go to a job interview. They're not going to like me because that bitterness is flowing through you. That poison is flowing. Oh, they're not going to do this, and they're not going to do that, and they're not going to do this. Man, when Lizzie told me something the other day, I said, what do you mean that's going to happen? You didn't even walk in there yet. She goes, Dad, how can you be so optimistic about everything? I said, optimism, my hope is in the Lord. And when I pray, I know what the Lord wants. And if the Lord wants it, they could tell me no 99 times. But the 100th time, it's going to happen. Those 99 times that they said no, that's just God saying, I ain't ready yet. I ain't ready yet. I ain't ready yet. But the Bible says to keep on seeking, keep on knocking. If you knock, the door shall be open unto you. If you seek, you shall find. We have to understand to be persistent that if God said it, it's going to happen. It's not optimism, honey. It's faith. I know my God will do this. The favor of the Lord is upon you. How do you know that? Your name is Elizabeth Grace. Your name is Grace for a reason. The favor of God rests on you. You go in with your name. We gave you a name that you wouldn't forget in your heart who you were. Elizabeth, consecrated unto God. Grace, the favor of God, is unmerited favor of God. So when you walk in, it's your name that the God has to honor because God named you. God gave you identity. It's got to be hidden in your heart that when the whole world has turned against you, you stand up and say the favor of God is upon me. You have the power to change things. But if there is bitterness, 
it poisons that. I preach anywhere, but it took a long time. I would preach to one, and I preached to a hundred, and I preached to a thousand. And God quickly quickened me in my life. It's not about the crowd. It's about what you have in your heart. And if I'm sending you to one, that one may be the next Billy Graham. And they may reach millions upon millions of people. Or if I send you to a thousand, that might change an area or a region. If I send you to 10,000, it may change a country. But in all things, you have to be secure in your heart. God constantly tells me, almost weekly, what's your name? What's your name? Constantly. Some people think that's silly. Constantly. I'm telling you, I pray for a pencil when I lose it. Why am I going to sit there and try to think back and stress myself out? How did, where did I put it? What did I do? Or lose my car keys? No, I say, God, where are these keys? Send me to them. I don't want to waste any time. I'm going to be 48 years old. This time. You know, I got I to milk every minute that I have for the next half of my life, you know. I ain't got time to waste being frustrated. What happened to the keys? Where did you put my, Victoria, where are you playing my keys? Mom, where'd you hide my keys? Elizabeth, did you take my truck? Where are my keys? No, I ain't got time for that. God, where are my keys? I'm telling you, did you check the kitchen counter under the envelopes? I go over there. I had opened up some mail and left it right there. I go and uncover, and voila, there are the keys. 30 seconds. I'm not all over the house. I'm not scrambling. I'm not losing time. I prayed him for everything. So he asked me, what's your name? He said, David. I said, what's David mean? Beloved, do you know I love you? Do you know there are times the enemy wanted to take you out because of everything that you were doing? And I said, no, that's my beloved. I love him. It was my love that covered you. It's my love that sheltered you. It's my love that carries you. It's that same love that must come out every day of your life. I can't give you more unless you let it go. Have I not promised you? I will pour out into your bosom everything, every blessing, every promise, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Have I not promised that? Yes, Lord. So whenever the enemy comes and tries to attack my finances, you can attack all you want to, but God's got more money than you could take out in Jesus' name. I'm not going to get distracted with your little mess because God has got me way beyond that. My God owns the cattle on a thousand hilltops. My God will never fail me. He is there for me. Bitterness brings division. How to overcome bitterness? Jesus says it. Forgive. You could read the rest of that chapter. Forgive. Let it go, people. Hello? Let it go. Let it go. They don't know. Let it go. It's harming you more than it's harming somebody else. They don't give a rip. They're sleeping nice at night, snoring on my pillow or something. And you're thinking about, oh, my God, 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 how can they do this to me? I don't know what I'm doing. Pacing, 3 o'clock in the morning. I ain't slept all night. I got to go to work. And you pay, go to work all mad, all angry. You can't believe what they did to me. I can't deal with this. I don't know. Let it go. Go, come unto me, you are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you, says the Lord. It's not that simple. No, but it is. For what Jesus died to give us is not valid. He died a horrible death. So that we could be free. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And why are the people of God so weighed down with offenses and bitterness? Why? Our actions show what we believe, not our mouth. Why do we get mad every time an offense comes? Why is there bitterness? Why? 
is we don't haven't truly given it to God. This morning, we're going to give it to God. There's a lot of stuff that's got to be dealt with in here this morning. And I hope that nobody will sit back and say, worship team as you're coming up, nobody will sit back and say, that's not me, pastor. To hide it means the enemy is going to be more powerful in that area in your life because he could only operate in darkness. But when we bring the sucker to light, he kicks and screams. I don't know. I'm not, okay. People may get mad at me, but it's like those old vampire movies. You bring them into the day. Ah! That was him. Ah! You bring them in. There. Open up the windows on them. Ah! Open up the car. Ah! The demons have to scream and they burn because the light of God overcomes darkness. But you have to bring it to him so he could shine. You uncover the darkness. God will not uncover the darkness for you. He can. He's all powerful. He will reveal some things, but he says the choice is yours. For you to take the blanket off of that thing and say, here I am, Lord. Deal with this. We're going to take care of that this morning. Everybody's standing. Nobody looking around. Heads down, eyes closed. We're going to pray. Then we're going to give you the invitation this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is a moment we need to be totally honest with ourselves. Please, we're trying to allow God to uproot a fence. This is a month of deliverance. This is a month of liberty. And revival happens in the house of the Lord first. First, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. My people. If you're here today, listen, I don't want you to hide it. I don't want you to talk yourself out of it. I don't, I'm going to embarrass myself. It's not about embarrassment. It's about dragging the enemy to light and allowing this area of your life to be free. And today we're talking about offenses and bitterness. The root of bitterness to be uprooted this morning. If you look at a situation and it still angers you, or you can't talk to somebody because of a situation, or there's something that makes you turn the other direction when you think about it, there's bitterness in operation in your life. You can't go and talk to a person because of something they did. There's bitterness that has turned into unforgiveness in your life. That has to be dealt with. Situations. When Sarah, 10 years into our marriage, Sarah came to me and she said, I got to tell you something. And she started to name everything that when we got married, everything I did to her, she said, I got to get this off my chest. And she said, I got to give it to you because I need to forgive you today. I've been holding on to this for 10 years and I need to forgive you so that our marriage could go higher and we could go deeper. I can't hold it anymore. I've been hiding it. I've been shielding it. But I need to come to you right now. I need to get this result and started to say things to me that I've offended her with that went unresolved that she just kept her mouth shut and just went about her business and kept walking and in that moment I didn't realize I had done any of those things but in that moment I told her with tears in my eyes looked her in the face and said I am so sorry my intention was never to hurt you my intention was never to be a knife to you. My intention was to be your husband, to pick you up, to love you, to care for you, to be there for you. And I'm glad you shared this with me because now we could forgive. I am sorry. You can't hide it, people. It'll come up 10 years from now. Today, if you're dealing with offense and bitterness, I don't want you looking around. I don't want you thinking who's going to say what. I just want you to step out of your seat. Why do we do this? I'm explaining this again. There is a prophetic act when you come out of your seat. You are telling the devil, I will no longer hide in darkness. I will bring this thing to light. That action is your faith in action that you are stepping out and you're saying, God, I don't care what people think. I don't care what they say. I want you and I want to take care of it. 
I need you, and I don't want the devil having power in my life in this area anymore. You've been offended by people, and you just it's harbored in your heart. You may not have told them something, but it's in your heart, and you try to avoid them. There's bitterness in operation. If you're here today and say, Pastor, I'm dealing with this, please step out of your seat. Some have already come. Some of our step out of your seat and come to the front. Apostle taught it very important to teach on this today because we need to make sure that this area of our life is clean. Please step out of your seat. Come to the front. Pastor, there's offense and bitterness. i got to have resolved by God. Please step out of your seat and come forward. She got it all so good. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Obey the voice of the Lord this morning, please. Please, don't think about image and reputation. That matters nothing when we see the Lord our God. I want him in my life. We sang the song prophetically. I want more. I desire more. I hunger for more. God, I deny myself and I come after you. Come on. Step out of that seat. I'm bringing the devil to light this morning. title you got on the front of your name those titles fall off we are children of the most high God let him do surgery this morning come on come on holy spirit from darkness into light you have taken me so in your hands here on the altar say Lord I thank you that you love me you don't get offended with me you don't get bitter with me you give me your love you're there with me 
day and night, and night and day, you will never leave me, never forsake me. And right now, Lord, I give to you the issues of my heart. Father, right now, I give you every offense. I give you every form of bitterness that I may have been holding on to. Whether I know about it or don't know about it, I give it to you. I renounce any covenant that I've made with the enemy in this area of my life. And today, I repent. Forgive me, Lord, and heal my heart. forgive myself think about that one for a moment I will forgive myself mm. I feel the presence of the Lord I will forgive myself say it to your hearts. Woo! I receive you, Father. Give my God. 
trust you, Lord. We thank you. We love you. We honor you. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Amen. Amen, church. Amen. In that same spirit, may the Lord bless you. I got a couple of announcements, and just before that, can we bow our heads and the leadership, please pray. Let's continue to stand. Uh, we're about to exit the service. Uh, it's a very important moment. Leaders, please pray. Um, if this morning you heard this message and you know that there's a God that loves you so much and he forgives you even when you become bitter against him and when you carry those things that offended you if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior if you don't have him as the one lover of your soul would you lift up your hand and join him this morning just lift up your hands everybody pray if you don't know Jesus and you want him as the Lord and Savior of your life. All hearts clear. If Jesus came right now, you would be able to go with him into the heavens because you've accepted the blood sacrifice at the cross. All hearts clear. Everyone say amen. 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 Praise the Lord. So now we're just going to have a few announcements. Today is the graduation of the New Hop Leaders class. Yes, praise the Lord. There's an expansion in Orlando happening. Thank you. And the Lord is creating and making new ways in Orlando. The, the expansion is growing. If you don't have a house of peace, get with your mentor or your uh, pastor of the net, and they will refer you to one. The next announcement is the new inner deliverance and the inner healing and deliverance retreat. It's September the 24th. That is a Saturday at 9 a.m. And it's completely cost-free. Come and receive. 
If you have been to one before, come and receive. And if you can serve, go ahead and see Minister Miriam or myself, and we'll get you connected. Next, September 9th and 10th, the explosion! Our youth are going to be having an explosion in Orlando. They are bringing Prophet Diana Finkelstein, and God himself will be here. Yes! Touching our youth, expanding our youth, and making them anew. Thank you, Lord. September 14th, for everyone in English, that is a Wednesday, 7.30 p.m. We will have a mega hop right in this place. How many people love the new carpet? Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful? Praise our Lord. And then, last but not least, CAP 2022. CAP 2022, October 13th to the 15th. That's because many people are going to stay in a hotel. If you still need a hotel room, please call the office. Pastor Carolina is in charge of that. And remember, every Monday has a prayer at 730. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, Bible Institute to the World. Then we have the Houses of Peace at 730 throughout Orlando. And on Friday nights, it's our Friday youth service. But everyone is welcome. And of course, Sunday, 9 a.m., 11 and 6. Let's bow our heads. Oh, if you have not given your offering yet and brought it, please go ahead and feel free to do so and bring up your offering. You may also text 45777, the word E-R-J-O. Again, the number is 45777, the word E-R-J-O. It'll take you two minutes. Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry. I just got a, uh, I just got a, um, a revision. The Mega Hop is actually going to be September the 7th. That's a Wednesday. So forget the date I told you, September the 7th. Let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I thank you for the audience that is also connected through the camera, Lord. The global audience, Jesus, King Jesus without walls, Lord. We also bless them and thank them for the donations, for everything that they also contribute into this house. Father, in the name of Jesus, I proclaim the blessing of peace and love that is in number 6, 22 to 27, that as your children go out, they exit and they enter, they exit and they enter into your goodness through your promises. Father, thank you that no weapon formed against them shall prosper as they go to their homes and they start this week and they come back for the 6 p.m. service. Father, thank you that you are keeping. And I declare a week of suddenlies and brand new blessings in you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Be blessed, people of God.